Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Channel 781 News Debrief. Um, this week, uh, we're covering two weeks of the Waltham City Council. We're going to be talking about the ongoing saga of the Better Bus Project. Um, and most recently, we're, there's a resolution on rat problems in the city uh, ongoing. Uh, we're going to talk about the sidewalk resolution that we've uh, discussed in the past. Um, there was also a special uh, tax levy meeting uh, that we're going to go over, uh, talking about homeowner tax credits, um, as well as uh, an update on the master plan committee, one of the last ones, as this is drawing to a close, uh, but it is hilarious, uh, so you should stay tuned for that. Um, this week, I am joined by the usual James Kerkelis. Everyone. Emily Spiria. And Josh Castor. Hello, everyone. Um, so first, we're going to talk about the Better Bus Project. Um, so as a short um, synopsis of this, where we're at right now, uh, the MBTA is changing a lot of their routes for their buses and trains. Uh, and Waltham's buses are going to change, I don't want to say dramatically, um, but uh, there are some major changes. Um, notably, in North Waltham, a lot of the uh, bus routes are being cut and trying to kind of everyone's being like pushed towards Market Basket, um, all the lines, um, as, as, it, as it seems to be becoming a hub of transportation, is, is I think uh, words people were using. Um, and George Darcy, the Ward 3 City Councilor in North Waltham, um, has been on a it has become his mission to make sure that the MBTA knows that he is not in support of this, um, which if you watch our show or watch the city council, you know it's hilarious because like six months ago, he introduced a resolution hoping to get more access to public transportation in North Waltham. This new plan, which MBTA, this is what they're going to do, uh, cuts more services. Uh, so hilarious. Two weeks ago, he attempted to invite the state reps uh, of Waltham, uh, a state senator and the mayor to come into a committee of the whole to say that they do not support this and that they hope the MBTA changes their mind. Um, and th this week, uh, nobody showed up in a very awkward moment that I think George was trying to make awkward, but he's like, okay, who's here to talk about this from my invited list, which is just not how that usually goes. But I think he just wanted to make it awkward. Um, and of course, no one was there. And so uh the next step for george uh was he moved to to send a resolution that he had written up to the mbta signed by the waltham city council and the president of, of the city council saying that they do not support these changes at all and that they hope they reconsider in the strongest of words and so george has been you know just like being negative towards the project up until this point he's you know inviting people in and stuff like this but what he's what he is deciding to do there is he's making the waltham city council be on the record they they you can he can complain all he wants but this is the first time where he said i want this body to say that we don't support this it turned into a, a longer conversation between george and kathy ann um, george kathy ann and colleen were the only people participating in this conversation i think um and Kathy Ann responds by instead having moving to have the MBTA invited into uh, a committee of the whole to hear feedback from them, to give feedback, and you know just to keep the conversation going. George, while he was okay with this, he invited all of the people that he invited before. He invited them again to this new meeting. He also raised his voice and. Uh, was kind of sour about the idea of his name not being on it. It's, uh, I think you thought that Kathy Ann was trying to co-opt his thing, which has kind of been like the story these past like few months. Um, but it turned into a very tense moment, um, which was kind of strange to me. Uh, but that that did go forward. And so they are invited. And then Colleen, uh, who had gone to actually the Better Bus Project uh, meeting from the MBTA uh, when they invited everyone. Um, she brought up uh, a very good point 
that they had planned to, to invite them in after these changes were already going to be made. Um, and so they tried to do a meeting earlier, but, but I mean, the unspoken thing that was being talked about was the fact that they can, they can complain all they want. These changes are happening next month. Unless there was, you know, riots in the street, the, these changes are going to happen and George can complain all he wants. And I hope he does. And he can be on the record as saying he did not support this and he tried his best, but this is nothing, nothing is going to change. Um, does anyone, does anyone disagree with that? I don't disagree with that, but honestly, like it would be really nice to see the city taking the initiative in this moment and like working with like the, maybe like the shuttle services in any of the two universities and like maybe the business parks to try to tie together transit inside Waltham, like get our own house in order. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, the MBTA is trying to optimize their costs and that results in everyone getting shuttled into a few like hubs. But I think that means that Waltham should be looking into how to better serve the citizens of Waltham by making transit available. And now that you're saying that, James, I think that um, Kathy and Harris had talked about looking into that, you know, how we can better serve the residents um, in, in Waltham and talked about the um, 128 Business Council and um, that, that was the primary option. I did also mention the Council on Aging, um, looking into what options are provided to seniors through the Council on Aging. Mm -hmm. Um, so there were a couple different options looked at um, in the event that, you know, this really is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been brought up a lot. And I think that's a really good thing that's been um, coming from, from this conversation is the idea of looking at what Waltham can do as a municipality for its residents in the term in ways of public transportation, if you know, if they think they're getting screwed over by the state, they can just do it. You know, they have they have the means, they have the funds. All it is is the will to want to do it. They can they can bus residents of Waltham anywhere. Plenty of cities do it. Lexington Lexington gets brought up in the past, um, having their own municipal bus service. So it's just the will to do it. There is, you know, um Eamon and Tom you know, on our last episode also brought, I thought, very good points, which, you know, I think at first, look, it's easy when you're comfortable somewhere and you don't want to move and you're pretty, you know, well nested in to say, well, I don't want to move to where things are, um, which, to be honest, is the situation I'm in. But, you know, when I went back and listened to what they had to say again, um, it, it does make some sense to think about moving people to where services are. Um, just, you know, start thinking about, you know, what time frame can a city realistically do that in and what, you know, services do we need in the meantime? Because we can't expect to just move everyone downtown all at once. Absolutely. Um, so I don't remember if George actually succeeded in getting that resolution sent to the MBTA or if they're going to bring them in first. Um, but I believe move January 12th is when the MTA is going to come in. Don't quote me on that because I'm just looking at the next time committee of the whole meeting. Um, but so that is going to happen. But again, these changes are going to happen. This is, we're just reporting on George's reaction. There's no, there's no stopping this. Um, moving on, also in that same meeting, um, Kathy Ann Harris introduced a resolution addressing the rat problem in the city. Um, uh, Emily uh, was giving us a good synopsis of it um, in this pre-meeting. Um, Emily, would you like to explain what this is? Sure. So for, for a while, I think a number of residents have been concerns um, and it sounds like voicing complaints to their respective counselors um, about the use of, of course, both, both about um, rat related concerns in terms of presence of rats, uh, whether it's rats living in the hoods of their cars, 
running around outside their apartments, um, once in a while inside apartments, um, down by the river, um, you know, just general public health concerns. But then on, you know, in addition to that concerns that, for example, you know, we've lost one, if not someone remind me, is it now two bald eagles to rodenticide, um, you know, basically, Coumadin, um, which is a blood thin thinner, is used in, um, you know, amounts that is lethal to a rat. They just bleed out internally. Um, and that is, you know, often how rat populations are controlled. But what happens is, you know, larger predators, um, you know, whether it's an eagle or, um, you know, an owl or a fox, um, if they then eat a rat that's, you know, eaten this drug, um, they also will be poisoned. Um, so enough residents have now voiced concerns to their counselors that this resolution came through. And, and Randy LeBlanc made a statement like, great minds think like, which makes me think that there were multiple um, resolutions around this potentially in the pipeline, but overall it had very strong support from all the counselors. So um, definitely time, time for a resolution like this. Um, James, in our, in our personal life, you talk a lot about rats. Do you have any strong opinions about this? I, I really hope that in addition to like using less poison, the city also pursues uh, better waste management practices to prevent those because at the end of the day, these rats are eating from somewhere. And if we had better like practices for our garbage handling and maybe more standard or better, better uh, regu regulating of like dumpsters and stuff, this might be less of a problem. And mm. I think it's important to go after the root causes rather than just, you know, putting out more electric boxes to ele electrocution chambers for rats. Yeah. Um, I think the resolution kind of sucks. Uh, if I was more well prepared, I could uh, show you examples of strong resolutions and then kind of just like kind of weak resolutions. And I think this is kind of a weak resolution because Kathy Ann Harris, to her credit, amazing project manager, amazing person for projects in the city, huge resume for making projects happen. But this resolution does not read to me like it's going to become a great project. It doesn't read to me that it's got the, the, the guidelines to lead to a very successful like venture. This reads to me like, I think the resolution is literally like the, the city of Waltham will work together with the mayor and, uh, and the traffic engineer, I forget, probably the DPW actually, uh, to come up with a plan to address the rat problem. And it's just like, that means nothing. It's not very concrete at all. No, no. And there are examples of more concrete resolutions that are more successful. Um, and some that Kathy Ann has authored. But this screams to me like people have been emailing about rats that she wants to be able to say that she did something about rats. And so, yeah, they're looking at a plan. They're doing rats. Um, and so, it, and of course, we're going to talk about this forever for the next year. But it is timely that the election is coming up next year. Um, so to be able to say on her thing, on her pamphlet, so let's quote it here on the pamphlet, rat problem, I did something, um, but nothing, I, 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 I would be very surprised if anything comes from this. Um, so either she's going to do a lot of work in committee and really hash out how this plan is going to actually come about instead of just like, I hope, I hope the city works together. Um, I think, I think this is kind of a, a weak resolution personally. Uh, sidewalks. Uh, last week uh, in ordinance and rules, the sidewalk clearing resolution was brought up. And um, Josh, I don't know if you want to take a synopsis of where we're at currently. Yes. So what we knew so far was that Councillor Harris had introduced a resolution that would require property owners to clear um, the snow from the sidewalk in front of their property. That's very similar how it works in Boston and a lot of other cities and towns around here. Um, and the one odd thing about this, though, was it would have an exemption for single family 
and two family homes. So that's about half the town. That's about mm -hmm. half the city is. And so I had, we talked about this before and my concern was it's, it's a very flawed idea because if you want people to, if it's a safety thing, it should be done by everybody. And um, if you want people to take it seriously, you can't give arbitrary exemptions. So you can take it from there, Chris. Yes, um, so that's a, a great synopsis. Um, so Kathy Ann, in an earlier meeting, brought up the fact that she thought there was going to have to be a public hearing um, for this, for this ordinance uh, change uh, in our charter. Uh, and everyone seemed to be on board with that. A lot of the constituents that reached out to her saying, you know, they had ideas for why this was a bad thing. She was like, oh, just bring it up at the public hearing. It probably needs to be a public hearing for this. So you can bring up then and we can talk about it and we can work together. Um, those emails do exist. So it's not just me saying words. Um, and in ordinance and rules, uh, I wasn't even watching for this particular thing. And then all of a sudden I hear it get brought up. Uh, oh, I would like to take the sidewalk resolution off the table. And she was just like, oh, it turns out we don't need a public hearing. And so, uh, so to not waste city resources, we're just going to send it through to a first reading. And uh, for folks that don't know, you need three readings uh, for uh, an ordinance change to pass. Um, historically, after the first, you send it to the law department. Um, and then they come back and say everything is fine. What's interesting about this is that it was already sitting in the law department, I think. Um, and so I don't even know if they're going to, they might just literally skip to the very end in ordinance and rules. Um, but backtracking, her her sentence, oh, it's, we're not gonna waste city resources. So we're just gonna make this into a, uh, we're just gonna send this off to a first reading. Like she said that so nonchalantly and so like matter of fact, it's like, yeah, this is what we always do. It's like, why would we waste city resources? It's like, and that's why we need city councilors that will like pause and like make people like explain themselves because like, wait, why why don't we want to use city resources for that? Why wouldn't we want to use city resources for a public hearing? Like that seems like a good use of city resources. But what else are we what else do we want to use city resources for in the terms of accountability and transparency? Like people want a public hearing. You could do a public hearing, but to, to just decide. No, we're not going to raise the city resources and no one challenged her on it you know it, it was approved and that was two weeks ago this week it was approved the first reading was is approved it is now back in norton's and rules uh so no one challenged her on it um and so it, you know it's more everyone's fault and not just cassie ann but like to have and that's why again policies is a very dirty game where she can say the thing that she can say that sentence that sounded good that sounded like yeah it's fine uh, we're not going to waste city resources. We'll just send it off to a first reading. But like, if you really think about it, like, we should be doing that. And that sentence is not okay. But the way she said it, she's very good at it. It sounds it's like a very yeah, okay, lawyerly okay, move. I, I would say. What's that? I said it's a very lawyerly move. I would yeah, say. Yeah, no, serious. Like, like, yeah, we're just going to do this. But it's just like, why? Wait, what? We just, it's, it's gone. The idea of the public hearing is gone. And now, and now it is gone. There's, there's no public hearing. Uh, so this very bad bill, um, and if we can um, show uh, our friend Eamon Dawes's great tweet that we showed before, but if we could insert it here, Josh, sorry for making you find us again, um, showing the map of Waltham where, where single family and two family houses exist and where people would be exempt from having to shovel the snow. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bad bill. And Kathy Ann did not work enough with the community on this. And it's just going forward without any more community input. Um, so it's a real shame and uh, sad to see. Two more things, uh, the tax levy meeting. Um, so I'm gonna give a little bit of background and then uh, James will take this over. Uh, but every year for the past four years, I don't know, something like that, Waltham does uh, something called a homeowner tax credit, if I if I'm if I'm recalling correctly, um, 
This is actually the thought child of Robert Logan, the old Ward 9 city councilor. Um, it's kind of his legacy, uh, but no one really likes mentioning that. Um, where folks that uh, own their property, owner occupied, get a tax subsidy essentially. James will explain more. Um, and the problem, the, the issue has always been it's on the backs of non-owner occupied uh, establishments, which is landlords. Um, and so this, this year's meeting uh, just happened and I'm gonna let James explain and then we can talk more. The way that this tax break works is that it basically reduces, it, it functionally like reduces the value of your home for the purpose of taxes on that assessment. So that's, that's the way that credit works too. So that it basically reduces the value by 35%. And that's the other part of how this goes together is they, they, they have that, 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 30, that up to 35% that they can increase the reduction that homeowners get. So first you have to have enough commercial zoning for the city to qualify to be able to do that. And then also have that value turned up to 35% is actually a re relatively high as far as I'm aware for what it can be. This season, uh, if you're in a, uh, how, if you are a, living in a house or a condo that for the unit price is uh, not nine, uh, 967,000, you will be breaking even as a result of this tax being, bill being placed or th this, this tax structure. And essentially what this does is establish two taxes, like one for the, the uh, record, relies on having like a two tax rates, basically like one for commercial, one for residential. So that commercial is paying a higher levy. And then also as a part of that is the residentials that are of the highest income strata also pay that, but basically aren't, are the ones that are not breaking even. So now what sort of is being hidden in this, or is, I wouldn't say necessarily hidden, but isn't, isn't immediately obvious, is that within that sort of 9% is all these rental units, which are like the, uh, this is the, uh, and, and to have a sort of voice a complaint about the, um, quality of the data that was uploaded. This is a photocopy of uh, the, the printout, probably a color printout, not a color photocopy, that then scanned and then uploaded. So these, these lines are actually different colors originally, and it's kind of difficult to read uh, as a result. But essentially what happened from, what, what happens as a result of this is that this is the nine, this, this plot comprises the 9% that is not breaking even and is broken down by value. So within this, the value of single occupancy houses, single family homes comprises just 25% of that 9% that is not breaking even. Whereas out of that close to 45% is what would be uh, renter occupied buildings is in that over 9%. And that's being paid by the landlord, which is obviously getting passed on to the, to the renters. Um, and so, so pr proportionately, uh, this is being basically paid for by, uh, to, to a, Lesser extent, the, the higher end of single family homes, to a greater extent, most apartment buildings. That makes sense. So that's literally class warfare. That is literally the upper echelon of Walthamites getting a tax subsidy being paid for by the lower echelon renters. And this has been talked about for, for the last four years. I remember when this first started being talked about, the idea that the owner occupied was uh, tax subsidy was being paid for by the by the uh, non-owner occupied, which is homeowners and, and renters. The idea was the that idea was thrown around. It's like, well, won't won't that just be paid for by the renters? And no one could ever get the city to admit to that. Uh, and I'll, I'll provide a historical anecdote, but I mean, that just, that just is true. I mean, it, you can argue about it, but the, the non-owner occupied are being charged more money and those are the landlords. And do you think the landlord is just going to pay that uh, from the like kindness of their heart? No, that will go on to the renters that, that will just be addressed in, the, in their rising rent. 
Um, and so, I mean, I think I can only I can only remember one anecdote where George Darcy tried to just ask very blatantly um, to Thomas Magno, who works for the city. Uh, I think it was two years ago. Will will renters pay? Do, I, I want to. I'm trying to remember exactly. I don't want to put words in people's mouth. I think he asked, "Will landlords raise their rents because of this?" Essentially, that is not quoting. Um, and Thomas Magno, not quoting him, uh, replied, "I think people will raise their rents because of the the rental market, because of the because of everything else." Uh, so he he could not. He he did not say that it was because of this and. And no one has been able to really get the city to admit that. But I mean, it's just like it's just like written on the walls. It's like who's that to, is that to, is what's happening. Who's to say why rent goes up every year? Yeah, it doesn't have yeah. to make sense. James, and, and I, I don't totally under. Can I ask you about the the second chart? I don't totally understand. So okay, so the top one or the bottom one? The bottom one. So the what? Are, one. So so could we have a different rate for commercial and residential, and then with residential, you get an additional credit on top of that if you have an owner occupied home. Yep. So why does that cause? Why this shows that people who have a home that's a million dollars or more actually don't benefit from that. But I don't understand why. Why would? Why would the, those people the, be losing on it? So so there's like a uh, like a pro, they apply like a progressive tax. Um, to the to this, I need to double check on exactly how that goes, but it, on exactly how that break even is set. But from the meeting, they basically were pointing out that it, as as the aggregate property value goes up, the break even also goes up, like the the the, the that threshold does go up as well. So basically, what it is is the there's like a higher aggregate tax as as a result of this. But then you get an exemption if you're an owner occupied property. So if you are live in a condo or you live in a single family house, you get that exemption. And then that is like, if that exemption then gives you uh, less taxes in it overall, that is going to then show you above this line. If that exemption doesn't result in you getting less total taxes, it's below this line. So. Got it. So it's this is assuming that if you weren't getting the credit, you would be paying a higher rate. Yeah, this was actually followed up on directly by Carlos uh, when he was questioning the, uh, um, sorry, the the about what was the actual change in the in the so like who's paying the most taxes essentially. And that's this chart right here, which is um, basically they highlight. It's, it's super small to see. I apologize, but uh, essentially Boston Properties is paying. 10% of all the total taxes for the for, as a result of this. And they're a major like office holder, as is Hobbs Brook real, real estate. A lot of this is stuff that's just off 128. So as I go down the list here, the top like bunch of these are all office buildings. However, if you look just a little further down, I mean, it, it trails off pretty quickly from 10% all being Boston properties to 5% being Hobbs Brooks. Now then below 1%, you've got like a lot of uh, utilities and office buildings still, but then at the half of a percent point, you, have a lot, you start to see a lot of apartment complexes. And as I look at this here, you see Garden Crest is one of the highest, most valued apartment complexes that accounts for the largest percent of levy out of all apartment complexes. And it's not in the best condition, you know? It doesn't strike me as the place that should be, that, that getting a uh, higher tax levy relative to a bunch of single family homes, you know? and. The, it's worth pointing out that this percentage of a levy did go up year over year. Uh, last year for Boston properties, it was nine percent, and and like Hobbs work was was below below five, for example. I know that makes it much clearer. But thank uh, you. I think this is really important for people to go in to understand going into the next election, because I think affordable housing came up a lot, or all a bunch of issues related to housing came a lot came up a lot in the master plan meetings. And, you know, if you sort of talk to, when you start talking to people about housing, you kind of get the impression that, you know, oh, everybody wants more multifamily housing in Waltham to address the high cost, but, you know, we just haven't figured out the right way to do it. We need the right project that deals with the traffic issues and this and that and the other thing. But the other thing that's more important to understand is that the city of Waltham spends money to disincentivize housing. The city of Waltham has this tax credit for 
owner occupied that is being basically paid for by renters and commercial property owners. So that's one way that it incentivizes single family home ownership is if they're providing some kind of benefit to the community that the rest of us aren't. The other one is that we've seen that they will sometimes purchase properties to prevent them from being used as housing. It's interesting too, because it's not like there's been a lot of single family home building in Waltham either. They, they had the numbers for like the number of homes and in like a 20 year span, you're talking about a total of a hundred more houses being built. and. So it's it, it, it's interesting how like from a future development standpoint, this all relies on having property values in aggregate go up and also more commercial development happen for assume, assuming that that commercial development then also has increasing property values. And it's a little concerning to see so much tied to basically like the market and whatever the whim, like whatever, like the whims of that might yield, because at, at this point, like we, we're talking about seeing a as as a result of property values going up. There's a, the the um, that threshold goes up as well, and that means that there are more pe more places, more more properties that are then below that threshold breaking even. At the same time, you've got their, our teachers not getting a wage adjustment for inflation. You know, these things go kind of hand in hand for where the city's priorities are. And it, it, it's a little, it, it was interesting seeing that sort of come up back to back with like, at least in this, in this, like the, this six months that we've been watching it, you know, it, so if the if it doesn't incentivize single family home ownership or single family home development because those things are kind of flatlined, what is the justification for it? it? It just increases the value, you know, because it restricts the supply. So there's going to always there's going to be a greater demand for it. So because there's as long as there's more people that want to live here, the values are going to go up, and the city's going to continue having its budget go up as a result. And the people who found themselves in a single family house are going to find that to be an increasingly rarefied position to be in and relative to everyone else. And it's also sort of an interesting way to frame it that like, this does make it less competitive to build apartments in Waltham, you know, mm -hmm. and that's has significant impacts for what the housing prices are going to look like here. And it's not doesn't strike me as a massive coincidence that that means that the housing prices are going to go up. So you have people who are, you know, have, who work in real estate, uh, acting as city councilors that are overseeing policies that cause property values to go up at the expense of people who don't own property. Mm. It's, it's almost as if cause follows effect or something, mm. or cause leads effect. Oh. And for the record, nobody recused himself. Chris, what would what was the justification that was given for this when it was passed? Was it just to make to, to make a better deal for people who already yeah. have a good deal? Oh basically? yeah, no, no, that's 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 just it. They they were just looking for a way to save homeowners some money. It was they, they, it, it was it was framed like the middle class, it was like saving the middle class. It was like you know talk about what can a city councilor do for you? This is literally putting money in your pocket. Um, and that's what they, they, talk they, about they always day. say 91 percent of homeowners benefit from this and it's worth mentioning that that's not 91 percent of the population of waltham yeah well thank you james that was actually very informative i learned a lot from what you just said <laughs> thank you james for being way smarter than me and being able to analyze some of the stuff way better than i do um so last thing i want to talk about master plan committee um if you've watched any of our shows uh in the last four or five months you understand uh, that the Master Plan Committee of Waltham is holding listening sessions across the city. Um, and they've had ward meetings in all nine wards. Uh, and this past Tuesday was supposed to be the last meeting, which was a citywide meeting um, where everyone was invited. Um, and then on Monday uh, at the city council, uh, Brandy LeBlanc, who is the chair of the master plan committee announced that they were going to have to reschedule it because of a posting issue um and uh the very next day in the morning uh all social medias uh all of Waltham social medias uh said uh that it had to be uh canceled the same day um and what's interesting is uh james why don't you explain um what you observed 
earlier in the night. Oh, so I was uh, I showed up to the tax meeting to watch that one, of course. And I took the opportunity to check the, the posted postings because I hadn't seen a, po a posted agenda for the Waltham, like uh, the, the, for, for the meeting on that was supposed to be on Tuesday. So I then raised that with uh, Joe Vizard and he, he mentioned to email him. So I followed up with him in an email and then there was the social media postings. To be clear, I'm not sure if the city would, would admit it, uh, but James Kelly's, who I learned uh, right before this meeting, James checked every for a posting for every single one of these board meetings uh, on this bulletin board of truth uh, that we've uh, that we bang our heads against um, sometimes on the show, um, which is amazing. I didn't even know James was doing that. Uh, James checked it one last time for this last one. There was no posting, which they are legally obligated to because it actually is a, uh, a public meeting. Um, and goes to Joe and be like, yeah, where's this, where's this uh, thing? Uh, there's no thing. Um, and Joe was like, okay, I'll get back to you. Um, and then they canceled the whole fucking meeting uh, because they didn't uh, post it correctly. So if you're wondering why the master plan committee meeting had to be postponed, it is because James Rick Kelly's uh, ruined it for everyone. Um, I, I, refuse I, to take I, 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 I refuse to take credit for this. I'm, no, just, you, gonna point I, out, I'm just gonna point out that as an organizer of me, many meetings, I can sympathize with someone forgetting to get the agenda ready the night before, until the night before. Yeah, yeah, except you are in the city of Waltham. Um, I, I did not have to comply with the open meeting laws, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I mean, it's very easy to make fun of the city at this very moment, especially because of how often uh, we complain about transparency and accountability. The only, I, and I could go on and on. The only thing I'll say, first of all, it's hilarious. Um, the only thing I'll say is that when we made a big, big ruckus around what we think the city should be doing in terms of transparency in meetings, the city responded, that's ridiculous. We only have to do this one thing. You're silly for even suggesting that we need to do anything else. They couldn't even do the one thing. That they had to do. So that's all I'm going to say. I could, I could, I could drag the city for a while on this very hilarious thing. Uh, but all I'm going to say is they couldn't even do the one thing. I just want to add um, because this is something we've talked about a lot earlier in the year about the bulletin board and meetings being posted. Um, whoever runs the city website has done an increasingly good job of making it easy to find events and meetings. Um, they kind of reset how that's set up. So I almost thought, you know, maybe instead of telling people to go to the Waltham Reddit for a list of meetings, I should, it's time to just tell them to go back to the city of Waltham website. And then no, because it turns out not everything goes in most places I just so we have a volunteer who I want to give a shout out because what he's doing is still important Tim Riley who has also been checking the bulletin board and I just discovered that tomorrow morning there's a meeting of the disability commission at 8 30 in the morning that wasn't on the website and so I think whoever is running the city's website is doing a good job I think the uh, many other people in the city are not doing a good job of getting the information to them on time so it is still important so thank you to to the people who are helping us keep track of uh when meetings are actually happening there has been some improvement but we're still not um to the point where you can totally trust any one source and thank you to Tim and to James for checking that bulletin board all the time um, so that's our show. I thought this was fun. Um, thank you, James, for doing a lot of the legwork here. Um, I feel like I learned a lot from this meeting as well. Uh, and we will we'll be back next week if there's enough to talk about. If not, we'll be back in two weeks. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Take care.